Hello Amazing Race Canada, my name is Tim Hague Jr., this is Tim Hague Sr., and we're coming at you from the winter metropolis of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. We're coming at you today to tell you exactly why we deserve to be on The Amazing Race. Listen guys, if you live in this town, you gotta be number one, a little bit crazy, two, a whole lot of strong, because it is friggin' cold here most of the time. And we're here to tell you that we're you guys, we got this covered. You we're coming can't. at you. We are here we are. Oh boy. Do you think that was too awkward? That was a little awkward. I felt awkward. I felt good, well, very awkward. Hopefully. Especially when the neighbors came out. Yeah, that was... <laughs> I think it's better with clothes on. <laughs> we'll keep it anyway. that way, I guess. Right. I don't know. Anyways, uh, folks, everyone has a story. And honestly, more than anything, we just want a chance to be able to tell ours. My dad, two years ago, three years ago, was given some news that most people it would have shaken them to the core. It would have probably rocked their world and they probably wouldn't have come out from it. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, which for those of you who don't know, it's a degenerative disease that at one day, at one point, someday, he won't be able to control his body. We want to be able to tell the world that just because a diagnosis happens does not mean that your world ends or that you have to stop fighting. Yeah, like Tim says, a diagnosis does not have to be the end. For me, 48 years old, I want to say to my wife, I want to say to my kids, I have four kids, I want to say to the Parkinson's community, that just because you've been given a diagnosis does not mean the end of your life, doesn't mean that you can't still compete, doesn't mean that you have to go quietly into the night and roll over with it. We want to, I want to stay strong for my kids and my family, I want to stay strong for my career, and continue doing what we do. Last year Tim ran his first half marathon, I've run a triathlon, one full marathon, multiple half marathons, and I plan on running another couple this next summer. Wow. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep doing. And we are convinced that this father-son team can be one of the best that you've ever had, certainly the best you've ever had in Canada. We want to compete. We want to win. We, Dad, we expect to Dad, hear from you. You're, yeah. you're getting really serious on us now. Well, I'm serious, folks. <laughs> we got to go. We're coming at you, folks. You want us. Here we go. Let's go. Well, good morning. good morning, and good morning to everyone on the live stream. Glad to have you here, wherever you're joining us from. As you can see, I'm not from here. Uh, now, on the, this morning, Samantha came and picked me up and my wife up from the hotel, and she said, you know, we were commenting to her about how it seemed kind of useless to have weathermen here, meteorologists, <laughs> because we were watching the, the weather last night, and it was like, What's today? Saturday, sunny, 96. Evening, 75, clear. Sunday, 96, sunny. Evening, 75, clear. Monday, 96, sunny. S evening, 75, clear. Oh, 20% chance of cloud. <laughs> and then she said, well, you know, it's been said here that you can have all four seasons in Texas in one day. And I'm like, you don't have four seasons in Texas. As you can see, that's winter. You don't have that here, do you? Oh, that was minus 15 degrees that day. We shot that. I like to say that in Winnipeg, it's only the strong. Only the strong. Everybody else moves to the West Coast. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be here this morning. My name's Tim Haig Sr., Tim Haig Jr. And if you ever wondered what it takes to get on The Amazing Race Canada, Two brown men in toques, as we call them, stocking caps, scarves, boxer shorts, in the snow worked for us. <laughs> now, question for you. How many of you know what The Amazing Race is? How many of you have seen the show? Okay, good, good, good. Quite a few. For those of us who are unfamiliar with the show, it is a reality television show. Stay with me now. I, I know some of you just went, huh? But it's a reality television show, and it's really the only good one. <laughs> because it tells the truth. What we did on the show is what they put on the show. We don't stop and start over. We don't embellish things. We don't elaborate on things. So all, when you go back and watch my show and you watch how many times we screwed up and really sucked, that was the honest to God truth, yeah, unfortunately. You can think of it as a giant scavenger hunt. Uh, typically, racers will race all around the world in our season, the first season of the Canadian show, we stayed in Canada. So we had the opportunity to travel all over Canada. Uh, we traveled to 
all three pro territories, seven of the ten provinces, and I saw more of Canada than I'd ever seen in my life. Since then, I've had the opportunity to travel to all the provinces, all the territories, and it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful country. And we were thrilled to have the opportunity to experience so much of it. But the goal of the race is to um, find a variety of clues, perform a bunch of tasks, all the while not coming in last on any given day. If you come in last, you are typically kicked off the show, unless you hit a non-LM. A non-LM is a non-elimination leg, which are predetermined throughout the course of the race. If you hit a non-LM, you get they spare you, you stay in the show, you stay in the race, but you have an extra task to do the next day. Almost all but guaranteeing that you're going to get sent home the next day. Right? So not only are you starting the day in last place, but now you have extra work to do that nobody else has to do. So it, it sets you up for a tough scenario. So, 2013, May, we shot the show. We started off in downtown Toronto. I wake up one morning in the Royal York Fairmont Hotel, and I know I'm living the dream because there's no way in the world I could afford this hotel on a nurse's salary. I wake up with the voices of my 15-year-old twins at the time, voices ringing in my head saying to me, Dad, if you don't do anything on this show, if you don't accomplish anything on this show, please don't do this, don't embarrass us. Now, why I would wake up on that first morning with the voices of my 15-year-old twins running through my head and their mental health being the first thing on my mind, I'm not quite sure. It must just mean I'm a really great dad. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's how it started. We kicked off our race. First place we headed to was Kelowna, B.C. Head across west to Kelowna, B.C., where you would have seen us get lost, making our first mistakes. Uh, well, actually, we made our first mistake in Niagara looking for the butterflies made a wrong turn right off the hop, was the very first team to get to the butterflies, but ended up coming in last to the butterflies because we made a wrong turn. First mistake, first task right off the, off the bat. We nonetheless get out of Niagara, make our way to Kelowna. You'd have seen us get lost looking for a train trestle that we needed to find, but nonetheless got through that first leg, made it down to Vancouver, had no idea that there was so much Chinese spoken in Vancouver. You would have seen us struggle, get lost in Vancouver. Made our way out of Vancouver, onto leg three, back east to Alberta, where the best way to tell this story is to let you see it, where I got myself tied up in a little line dance, and my son got us lost. Right here, Dad. Oh, Timothy! Roadblock. Who wants to get in line? Yeah, I'll take you it. Do it. I'll take it. Okay, okay let's go. Yeah, oh my goodness gracious! Show them how the black man dances. I don't think I did Try it again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I stumbled a couple times, but it's getting there. It's close. We've been here close to three hours, man. Really? Shoot. All right, all right, you're freaking out. Just chill out. Just chill out. What can you say? This just isn't his thing. I should have done it. Sorry, man. I may have to go home. I don't know. Hey, it sucks. Just keep it going, man. Okay. Don't give up on me, all right? Okay. I'm finally just frustrated. It's my ninth time. I just want to be done. Congratulations. Good not give up, Dad. Let's go. We need a challenge that we can do. <laughs> <laughs> we can do all challenges, Dad. It's just how well. A challenge that we can do well. Let me restate it. Let's get it going. Wash those. Here we go. Tim Jr., Tim Sr.
Let's lift it. Try it. Wait, one, two, yeah. three. Money. But uh, Mr. Smarty Pants here comes up with a brilliant idea that we just pick the wheelbarrow up and dump it in. All right, my son. This is our car, sir. Congratulations, gentlemen. This car meets Yes. Thank you, sir. Drive yourself to Horse Thief Canyon Overlook to find John at the next pit stop. Oh, we passed it. Yeah. I know exactly where that is. You're going to be going left, and uh, it'll be on the right. As long as you're positive we're going in the right direction, Oh, yeah. Good. No, no, I'm positive I've seen it today. Okay. And this, uh, it, how, I don't, can this be right? I don't, I don't know. Should I pull the cops over and ask them? Oh, Steve can. Oh, that's uh, by the museum. It's by the museum? Around in a circle for crying out loud. We're clearly going the opposite direction. The deduction is we have to be last. That's why we've lost. Because of stupid crap like that. Tim and Tim? You were the last team to arrive. Yep, I figured as much. However, this is a non-elimination round. No. And you are very much still in this race. <laughs> Somebody up there likes us, man. We just keep on rolling. <laughs> that makes no sense. I don't feel like this is who we can be. When you don't feel like you're living up to your potential, then it's frustrating. We are here to win. And I appreciate that everybody else kind of thinks we're on the back burner, that they don't have to think about us. I just hope that they keep it there so that when we fly past them, they wonder what in the world happened. Amen to that. You ever have one of those days? <laughs> yeah. That day in Alberta absolutely frustrated the Thames. I could not get past this race. I could not figure this race out. We were frustrated. I hadn't been eating well. I hadn't been drinking well. I had not been sleeping well. Nothing would go right on this race. Now, I want to tell you something. That dance that you saw me do there, back in 1989, when I moved from Kansas City to Winnipeg, Canada, I got myself into a little line dancing competition doing, you remember the boot scoot and boogie? I took home CFL Blue Bomber tickets that day because I was the best dancer on the floor. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> she didn't even see me dance. <laughs> Give this old boy Parkinson's, and while well, you're beating, you're dancing to a whole different tune now, right? What you saw there of that dance was the most of that dance I ever got straight. And the only reason I got that part right was because one of the other teams took me aside and said, Tim, it's not a four count, it's an eight count, do it like this. I was finally so far behind, we were the last team to leave, we were so far behind, they finally said, just please leave. Because those poor dancers had to repeat that song every three minutes, whether we were ready or not. They'd do the dance, they would rest for three minutes, it'd start again, and I had to be ready the next time. When, so by the time they turned me loose, it was just like, please get out. That's the most I ever figured out of that dance. Tim Jr. says to me, Dad, I know exactly where Horse Thief Overlook is. We passed it this morning. Interesting thing about Drumheller, Alberta. Had the opportunity to go back there a couple summers ago. As you drive into Drumheller, there are three, count them, three great big green signs that lead you to Horse Thief Canyon. Uh, Horseshoe Canyon, sorry. We needed Horse Thief Overlook. He took us about 10 minutes in the wrong direction. We knew at that point that we had to be last. We had a good feel for where the other teams were and were very confident that we were going to come in last that day. As we came to the mat that day and you saw us jogging up there, I figured that I had about a 50-50 chance of being sent home because we were students of the game. Before we ever went on this race, my wife was an absolute fanatic of the American show, had watched every single episode of it. We knew that if you watched the American show, there were typically two non-LMs scattered throughout the course of the race. We knew that there were 10 teams, nine teams on the show. That typically meant there were going to be nine legs. 
So we knew that a nodal limb should pop up somewhere around leg three or four. So as we jogged to the mat that day, I figured I had about a 50-50 chance of being sent home. We come to the mat. John, the host, says to us, boys, you're the last team to arrive. However. Ladies and gentlemen, the word however is, has become my most favored word in the English language. <laughs> however, this is a non-elimination leg, and you boys are still in this race. Let me tell you, my spirit went, yeah! I was absolutely thrilled that we had dodged the elimination, that we were going to get to stay in the race, that we weren't going to embarrass my kids, and that we we're going to have another chance. But in the very next second, my spirit went, no, because I realized we didn't get to go home. We had to stay. We were still going to have opportunity to embarrass the kids tomorrow because we were going to now start last tomorrow and have that extra task to do and very little chance of surviving it. As we left the map that day, went back to our little dinosaur-inspired hotel. And if you have been to Drumheller, Alberta, you will know that that is where God sent all the dinosaurs to die. <laughs> Put a spade in the ground anywhere in the Drumheller, and you will come up with a rib. There's bones everywhere. So our little hotel was dinosaur-inspired. We go back to our little hotel, and we get into a conversation that basically goes like this. What in the world are we going to do? Because we can't figure this out. We can't get the rhythm of the race down. We can't figure out the clues. We, we just can't get a handle on it. And as we sat there talking that evening, I don't remember how we came around to it, but we came around to the discussion of tattoos. I have four children. You have to understand, the first two, a boy and a girl, basically came out of the womb saying, Daddy, I want a tattoo. <laughs> Daddy has always said no to tattoos. I am not a tattoo guy. But in Canada, the age of majority, legally, you become an adult at 18. I said, when you're 18, you do to your body whatever you please. On their 18th birthdays, they had their first tattoos. Guess I'm not such a good dad as I thought, eh? I can't complain too much of Tim Jr.'s choice in tattoos. On his left bicep is a symbol of the Christian Trinity. On his back is a passage from the Christian scriptures. One verse, Psalms 46.10, has two words. It says, cease striving. That evening, as we sat there in Drumheller discussing how we were going to try to figure out this race, we came across that word striving, and we started talking about it. We realized that we really didn't remember what it meant, so we, had, we did what we do these days, which was go back to Mr. Google and Google the word striving. You Google the word striving, you will find that it means to contend, to quarrel, to fight, from the Old English. It has a bit of the Old French attached to it for the word strife. It is that freaked out, stressed out way of thinking that says, by God, I am going to make this thing happen no matter what it takes. And we realized that that's how we had come into the race, that we were going to win this thing, that any gross food they gave us to eat, we were going to eat it. Any challenge they gave us to do, we were going to do it. And if you got in our way, we were going to run you down because we were here to do this thing, and we were going to make this happen. But the simple truth was it wasn't working for us. So we made a decision that evening there in Drumheller to stop and start over. Not stop racing, but to stop this destructive mindset that we'd gotten ourselves into and start our race again. We realized that first and foremost, we weren't having fun. And we asked ourselves, how could we be in this place? How could we be given this opportunity, be given the blessing that this race had become, and not be at least happy in last place. For you see, we beat, we were given the opportunity to be one of nine teams out of over 10,000 applicants. There was a guarantee that there were at least 9,991 other teams who would have been more than happy to trade places with us in last place had they been given the opportunity. We decided there and then to start getting up every morning and simply have fun. 
we also made the decision to get up every day and simply do our best. Now this is where I'm often concerned that I'll lose you, that half the crowd checks out, because it sounds a little silly. It could sound a little trite, a little over, overly simplistic. Because what I just said could sound like this. The Thames managed to get themselves on a nationally recognized reality television show. They beat out 10,000 people to be there, 10,000 other teams to be there. Got on the show and found out they sucked. <laughs> so they decided to get up every day, have fun, and do their best. But I want to remind you of a little proverb that you've heard many times, and it goes like this. Everything you ever really needed to know in life, you learned in kindergarten. kindergarten. My kindergarten teacher was Mrs. Popovich. Mrs. Popovich and I would start off every day in kindergarten the same way. I would walk into kindergarten, she would look at me, and she would say, Timmy, shut up. <laughs> For you see, Timmy never had a problem talking. Obviously, speaking came to me early. More importantly, Mrs. Popovich would say to me often, Timmy, just do your best. Timmy was always in a rush, always had somewhere else he would rather be, always had something else on the go, and would remind me regularly to just do my best. How many of you have had a mentor, a teacher, a professor, a parent tell you the same thing? Just do your best. And aren't they right? Aren't they right? We live in a culture in a society, in an age that continually tells us day after day, moment after moment, every time you turn on the television, every time you turn on the radio, every time you look on the internet, that you're never good enough, that you're not smart enough, that you're not pretty enough, that you're not fast enough, that you're not rich enough, that your house isn't quite right. Your car could be a little bit better. Your clothes could be this. There's always something wrong with where you're at and you need to be a little bit better. And it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. I to I've always told my girls growing up, don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie that the magazines and the televisions tell you of what a young lady is to look like. The vast majority of women do not look like that. Don't believe the lie. The fact is, the best that any of us can ever give is our best. When Mrs. Popovich said to me every day, Timmy, just do your best. When your mentor said to you, just do your best. They were telling you once again, don't believe that lie that says you need to be something that you are not. Your best is all that you can do. For example, how many of you in the room have ever had a boss, a job, a somebody who'd tell you, if you really care about your career, if you really care about your position here, if you really care about your patience, if you really care about what we're doing here, you will show up to work every day for me and you will give me 110%. Prove to me, prove to this company that you really care. Well, question, how many of you can give 110% of anything? Don't raise your hand. Now, the truth is, my best looks different, can look very different one day to the next. And Parkinson's has brought that home in spades, amen? Yeah, we're in Texas. Can't get away with that so much in Canada. <laughs> Fact is, some days I wake up with Parkinson's and I'm almost normal. I feel pretty normal. I feel like I can pretty much get up and go do what I want. There are other days I get up with Parkinson's, and that, I, that just isn't the case. I cannot do and function the way I would like. My best looks very different from one day to the next. There are some days that I get up and I'm just plain lazy. But now that's an altogether different discussion. But my point is, the best that any of us can ever do is simply our best. Now, I'm never going to measure up to your best. You will never look like my best. 
Thus, our best is simply what we individually can do. Had you watched our race, you would have seen that we ran the classic underdog race. We were the dark horses. We were that come from behind Cinderella story that no one expected to happen. We were error prone and chronically behind. We had multiple opportunities to roll over and die knowing full well that no one would have been surprised and few would have mourned our passing. <laughs> Yet day after day, we made a decision from leg, leg three forward to get up every day and simply have fun and to follow the advice of a kindergarten teacher and to simply do our best. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to suggest to you that with our newfound focus, with our newfound calm and presence and intention, that our gameplay radically changed. However, we continued to suck. <laughs> but this is where the race taught us the meaning of the word perseverance. Perseverance is a great big long word that we don't like to use much anymore. Uh, we often look past it because it's often attached to things that are difficult, things that are hard, things that are uncomfortable, things that we don't like to talk about. Maybe things like Parkinson's. You put perseverance alongside the word Parkinson's, and you get a, a very uncomfortable conversation. When, we, when Tim Jr. and I first came across this word Parkinson, perseverance, Parkinson's, realized we once again didn't really know what it me meant. So we did what we normally do these days again, go back to Mr. Mr. Google. You Google the word perseverance, you will find that it means to carry on in your course of action, even in the face of difficulty, with little or no evidence of success. Once again, to carry on in your course of action, even in the face of difficulty, with little or no evidence of success. And Google that word, you will find that definition, and alongside it, a picture of the Thames. For you see, we had decided that we were going to carry on in our course of action, even if it was difficulty. But never did we ever give you any indication that we would be successful. We got lost all the time. You would have seen us make that first wrong turn in Niagara, where we should have been first into the butterflies coming in last. You would have seen us lost looking for the train trestle in Kelowna, BC. You would have seen me lost in translation, literally, in Vancouver, British Columbia. You would have seen us lost in Iqaluit. Iqaluit, Nunavut. I don't know if you know where that's at, but if you think Canada's a long way, the beginning of Canada's a long way north, well, this is way further north. There's not a whole lot up there to get lost in, folks. We managed it. <laughs> Cape Spear, Newfoundland the most easterly point in North America, well, first of all, Quebec City. You'd have seen us lost in Quebec City. We were looking for a university. We stopped and asked a mailman for direction. A mailman. Who better to ask for directions than a mailman, right? That's not a bad idea, right? He sends us right when we should have gone left. We spend an hour chasing our tails in Quebec City, only to come in last for the second time in leg six. Cape Spear, Newfoundland, most easterly point in North America. We were effectively in the semis. There were four teams left. We were in third position. All we needed to do was get to the mat and we would be racing for half a million dollars in cash and prizes and we got lost. The Toronto Zoo, the last leg of the race. We're finally in first position. We get to the Toronto Zoo before anybody else, managed to do it in an hour and a half, what the other two teams did in 15 minutes because we got lost. Over and over and over again, we struggled. Day in and day out, whether it was because of my Parkinson's or because of the simple fact that we couldn't read a map, we never gave you any indication that we would be successful. Yet we chose to persevere. We chose to carry on in our course of action, even when it was difficult, even when there was zero evidence of success. Now I have to ask you, how many of you watched my show? Really? I'm shocked. 
This far south, nobody's ever watched my show. Awesome, thank you. Did you think we were gonna win? No. She is a very bright woman. In Canada, if I ask this question, you know, the majority of the hands go up in the room and I ask how many of you thought we were gonna win and there's always that one lone survivor in the back saying, oh, I, was, I, I knew you were gonna win. I'm like, what are you smoking? We never, ever looked like we were going to be successful, yet we chose to persevere. People have often asked me, Tim, where does that will to persevere come from? Well, for me, it started in August of 2010. August of 2010, I was sitting in my kitchen on a Saturday morning, reading the newspaper, drinking my coffee, as I often do on Saturday mornings when a brand new thought entered my head. That thought was, my left big toe is twitching. Now, I had been a nurse for 18 years at that point. Any new little twitch gets my attention. And if you can imagine doing one of these with me. Yeah, my left big toe is twitching. I thought to myself, there's no good reason to wake up twitching. So I did what any good nurse would do. Any nurses in the room? Yeah, a little head-to-toe assessment, sitting there in my kitchen, said to myself, well, it could be psychological, but I'm not anxious, I'm not stressed, kids are okay, finances are okay, job's okay, the wife's good, she's not mad at me today. <laughs> there didn't seem to be any psychological reason for me to be twitching. So I thought to myself, if it's not psychological, it must be physiological. If it's physiological, it's likely Parkinson's or MS. Now you have to understand, my father passed away with Parkinson's, have a half-sister with MS. These things were never far from my mind. And that was literally my first five minutes on this journey with this thing called Parkinson's disease. So being the nurse that I was, being the good husband that I am, what did I do, gentlemen? Guys, you've got to be quicker. They will answer for us every single time. <laughs> Everywhere I go, the guys are so slow. You've got to step on it. But she's right, nothing. I kept my mouth shut is what I did. I thought to myself, this is August. We had, we had just passed our 25th wedding anniversary that July. We had a three-week vacation planned in Europe that October. I thought, you know what, we'll go on our holidays, we'll go to Europe, we'll have a good time. If it's still bothering me, if the twitch is still there when I get back, we'll check it out then. I won't bother. I might be wrong, it might go away, we'll leave it at that. Well, we decided to do in our 40s what you're supposed to do in your 20s, and that is backpack across Europe. <laughs> it was a lovely trip. We each packed one backpack. We booked our first hotel in Madrid, Spain, our last hotel in Athens, and for three weeks, nothing in between. Now, we had a great time, but word to the wise. Should you do this kind of trip, don't show up in Rome on a Saturday night without a hotel booked. We find ourselves stepping off of a train about 9 o'clock at night into a darkened train station. There was one poor student that, did, that looked like he didn't have two pennies to rub together, and a family that looked like they had even less, and us. Out of the shadows steps a guy, makes a beeline for the North Americans, because we no doubt have a credit card somewhere, right? Says to me, are you looking for a room? I said, yeah, I'm looking for a hotel. He says to me, I know a guy. Folks, if this was your kid and they got home to tell the story, you would kill them. <laughs> For I find myself following a guy who knows a guy who has a nice hotel room through the darkened alleys of Rome. The short story is he did know a guy. It was a beautiful little boutique hotel and it was fabulous. Cost us an absolute arm and a leg, but we spent the night in a bed instead of a park bench that night and I was happy about that. But the reality was, as I learned something about Parkinson's that day, I found out that any kind of stress, good, bad, or indifferent, will make your Parkinson's symptoms worse. That toe tremor turned into a foot tremor that turned me into a basket case saying to my wife, honey, something's wrong with me. 
She looked at me ever so lovingly and she said, sweetheart, we have known that for some time. <laughs> no, what she did say was, okay, something's up, you're twitchy, but relax. We'll finish our vacation, we'll go home, we'll see the doc, we'll check it out, we'll go from there. It's exactly what we did. Got back home, sat down with my GP, spent about 20 minutes in his office discussing the fact that I likely had young onset Parkinson's disease. But he said, we'll get you in front of a movement disorder specialist, we'll get you formally diagnosed. In February of 2011, that's exactly what we did. At the age of 46, I was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's disease. To say that I was unimpressed would have been the understatement of a lifetime. I was frustrated, I was angry, but mostly scared. Because remember, at this point I had nursed a lot of folks with Parkinson's. I had watched dad die with Parkinson's. There was no illusions in my mind as to what this diagnosis would mean for me. I unfortunately went on to do what many of us do when we get this kind of bad news. Sat down on the couch, got down, got depressed, stopped running, stopped cycling, stopped doing the things I knew I needed to do to look after myself, and sat there. After about a year, I finally shook my head and said, hey, this isn't how you live. This isn't how you respond to bad news. You need to get your rear end up off the couch. You need to get going. I did. That next summer, I ran my first and probably only sprint distance triathlon. Not a bad comeback. But I had to decide how I was going to respond to this disease. And I basically decided there was one of three, three ways I could t treat this thing. I could try to treat it as if it were benign, that it didn't matter, that I could set it on a shelf and ignore it. Well, you know as well as I do that that's just not possible. Seven years ago, seven and a half years, or let's see, yeah, seven and a half years ago, I was still nursing. I have been out of nursing now for just over two years, about two and a half years. Parkinson's has taken my job. My tremor wasn't nearly as bad seven and a half years ago as it is today. Thank God for good meds. The depression, the anxiety, those dark days didn't exist seven and a half years ago. All the stuff that comes, it's not benign, and she will not be ignored. So if it's not benign, I thought it could be a curse. I could be angry with God. I could do the shake your fist at heaven and why me? Why you let this happen to me? I'm a good guy, been a good husband, never cheated on my wife, look after my kids, provide for them, give back to my community. Why would you do this to me? And as I explored that thought, other thoughts started coming. 1964, born to a white 20-year-old girl, state of Iowa, found herself pregnant by a 30-something-year-old married black man. 1964, Iowa. Yeah, not good. <laughs> Subsequently adopted. I was actually born down here in Corpus. Uh, adopted by a white family. Had three of their own kids. Adopted not only this biracial kid, and trust me folks, there was not a line up out the door looking for us. They not only adopted me, but went on to adopt five more was given a roof over my, our head, food in our bellies, clothes on our back, an education, the opportunity to meet a wonderful girl from Canada. As of this summer, 33 fabulous years together, four wonderful children, incredible daughter-in-law, God's greatest gift to mankind, a grandchild. And as I worked through that whole scenario, I began to realize just how unfair my life had been. And that there was absolutely no reason in this world that I could be justified to raise a fist to heaven and ask God why, when I had never asked, why'd you give me all the rest? So it may be simple, simplistic, but to my way of thinking, if it wasn't benign and if it, I'm not going to allow it to be a curse, there was only one other thing that I could think that it must be, and that is a blessing. There must be something in this thing that is both good for me and for those around me. Thus, I chose from that day forward to, to walk forward with Parkinson's as a blessing rather than a curse and to embrace it as my new best friend, whom I hate, 
but nonetheless a blessing instead of a curse. Thus, when I walked into the Amazing Race Canada, I walked into that race with the same attitude that I walked through life with, and that is this. Parkinson's cannot have my life, therefore it could not take the Amazing Race Canada away from me either. When I stood on, on a, hundreds of feet in the air, at least that's what it felt like, on a 12-inch wide plank off a train trestle out over a gorge in British Columbia, I said, I will walk this plank and I will not fall off. When I sat in front of 10 pieces of muktuk, whale blubber, I said, I will eat this and I will not throw up. All the while having the voice of my mother ringing in my head, I hope you have one just like you. <laughs> but it is this attitude that compels me to live my best. This is the message that I share with people all over North America as I travel. How do we live our best? How do you live your best? Well, for me, it breaks down into three different components. One is to simply have the strength to do my best. To acknowledge that my best is good enough. That Mrs. Popovich was right. That my best is enough. And that's sometimes a hard thing to accept when you're bombarded with so many things it says it's not. I hear people often talk about me and say, well, I can't run a mile. I can't do the things that you do. Well, folks, I'm probably 20 years younger than most of you. Well, 10 years younger than at least most of you. <laughs> I've got a few years on you. So if we're not at the exact same place in life, that's OK. Our best will look different from one another. But to have the strength to do my best and to realize that I have to simplify my life sometimes. My life looks much different today than it did even two years ago, let alone seven years ago. I have had to focus on removing the extraneous things from life that just don't matter and focusing on family, my kids, the work that I can do, get over the fact that I can't nurse anymore and that it really freaked people out when I came at them with a needle. <laughs> Light, yeah, I know, that one's got a bit of a fuse on it, right? <laughs> but to let go of the extraneous things that I simply cannot control and, and accept what is. I can still run a mile and a half. That's what I'm working on right now. I'm working on getting to a 5K this summer. I cannot do it in an eight-minute mile anymore, and that bothers me. But I have to let that go, because I can do it in nine-and-a-half-minute miles. My wife doesn't understand why I'm so concerned about time, but that's what motivates me. And so I focus on what I can do rather than what I can't. And to pay attention. To pay attention to what really is important. What are the things that I want to do, that I need to do today? And to pay attention to those things. And a tough one in simply doing my best is accepting limits. Is accepting the fact that I just can't do everything that I wish I could. But when I stop and practice those things, I start to realize that my best really does look awfully good. The strength to do my best. The courage to be content with what my best produces. It's really tough some days to wake up and be content. Uh, another big long word that's difficult to put alongside Parkinson's disease, you look up the word contentment, it means an emotional state of satisfaction drawn from being at ease in one's situation. An emotional state of satisfaction drawn from being at ease in your situation. Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of you are at ease with your Parkinson's? How many of you are content with your Parkinson's? The only way I've really come to find, found to describe contentment is this. 
we had a tree, that a giant elm that grew in our front yard when we first bought our house 13 years ago that was one of the selling features of the house. It was a gigantic elm tree. Its branches flowed over across the street, covered a good portion of my neighbor's yard, covered a good portion of my yard. It was the largest and one of the most beautiful trees in the neighborhood for blocks around. One spring morning, an arborist from the city of Winnipeg showed up at my door and said, Sir, your tree is diseased. It's going to have to come down. I looked at the tree and I said, what? Are you serious? Look at it. It's full of leaves. It's beautiful. Well, you see how the trunk bifurcates there and has a bit of a split down it? Well, that split goes right to the ground. It's unsafe. It's going to have to be cut down. So I argued with her. I said, no, it looks great. It looks beautiful. It's not, she said, sir, it's on city property. It's coming down. I thought to myself, hmm, city of Winnipeg, see you in six years. About six and a half weeks later, Cheryl and I, my wife and I are sitting in the kitchen. We hear a chainsaw go. Make our way to the living room and for the next two and a half hours, watch seven men do this incredibly beautiful, horrific dance as they felled our giant elm. Huge limbs would come thudding to the ground. They had this little machine that they would stand on, come pick it up, throw it into a chipper, and at the end of two and a half hours, our elm tree was all but disintegrated. At the end of that process, my wife cried. When our daughters came home from school that afternoon, they cried. And I think that you would agree with me that it's good and right to mourn that kind of loss. But I think you'd also agree that at some point, you have to move on. So what do you do? You plant a new tree. You plant new in place of the old. The new tree that you plant will never be the old tree. It may not ever grow up in our lifetime to be the majestic elm that was standing there. But you can nonetheless have new growth and new beauty in place of the old. We choose to replant. Contentment. Contentment with Parkinson's. Parkinson's has felled my old life. Nobody asked. If they could cut it down, nobody came along and said, Tim, do you mind? They just said, it's going. It's gone. So now I have a choice. I can choose to replant and experience new growth and new beauty in place of the old, or I can choose to be bitter. But I choose contentment. And is it easy? <laughs> it's never easy. But whoever said life was going to be easy or fair? Daily, I choose to live my best. Daily, I choose to practice contentment. Daily, I choose to have the will to persevere, to carry on in my course of action, even in this face of difficulty, even when there looks like there will never be any success with this disease. The days when we stop and think, where's the cure? Where's the next uh, symptom control? Where is the help that should be coming? Even in those days, I will choose to persevere. I will stay in my race. I will stay on my journey because this is the journey that I have been called to. I am not standing in front of a bunch of folks with cancer because I was not given cancer. I was not given cardiac disease. There are so many other things that could have come into my life that haven't. I have been given Parkinson's. And I believe that I was given... Parkinson's was allowed into my life because I have the ability to deal with it. Or at least that's what I choose to believe. So I will walk forward and persevere and do my level best, realizing that perseverance can be learned. 
It is something that we can get our hands around, that we can sink our teeth into, that it is something that when we come to our wit's end and you reach those days where you've done everything that you know to do, you've fought and scratched and clawed and cried and screamed and yelled and you're absolutely at your wit's end and you don't know what else to do, I believe that therein is where we persevere. Therein is where we have, we can learn the next step to continue moving forward, to continue growing, see another win, see more success, and live better lives because we choose how we're going to live. When I, another message that I share with folks around the country is the power of perseverance. And that's where I break out those seven skills in my book, simply called Perseverance. In taking those seven skills and implementing them and working them into our lives so that we can continue to walk forward. Realizing that when we are at our wit's end, it's more than just don't give up. Are you like me? As people said to you, well, just hang in there. Don't give up. And does that annoy you? Because it annoys the daylights out of me. I always think, you know what? I work my tail off to stay positive about this thing, to keep walking forward with this, and just, just don't give up. Well, what does that mean? What am I supposed to do? I'm a doer. I'm a nurse. I'm a runner with, with, a, with a goal in mind. So you tell me just don't give up. I don't know what that means. I need something tangible that I can get my hands around. That is perseverance. Perseverance will give you seven skills, abilities, practical, positive steps that will take you forward when you don't know what else to do. And then when somebody says, just don't give up, you say, you know, I didn't give up a long time ago. I got past that. I've learned to persevere. Week after week as a race would play on television, we would get together with family and friends and we would watch it together. We called it viewing parties because we figured we were gonna, people figured we were going to die every week so they'd come to watch. <laughs> We'd have viewing parties either at a church or a community center, a Boston pizza or some such. Week, week six, we were in a Boston pizza. The lounge was absolutely packed with friends and family. We had overflowed into the restaurant. There were people everywhere, and we were having a great time right up until the time we asked that mailman for directions. As soon as we asked that mailman for directions and they saw that we were going the wrong way, the restaurant went quiet. As we come jogging up to the mat that day, it was clear that we were in last place. And as we come jogging up to the mat, we started getting the loser clap. You ever heard the loser clap? That slow, rhythmic applause that we hold dear for those that, that we hold for those that we hold dear and yet consider to suck at what they are doing. And as we made our way to the mat that day, it hurt that our friends and family would think that we were done. How could they think this? But as we ran to the mat that day, come to the mat and John says to his boys, you're the last team to arrive. However, this is a non-elimination leg, and you boys are still very much in this race. Your wives are going to have to live without you for just a little bit longer. That entire room exploded in applause. No one could believe that we had somehow dodged the elimination bullet. No one could believe that we had somehow managed to stay in the race again. We ran around, I ran around the room high-fiving everybody like it was the greatest thing since I'm not sure what, and it was almost as much fun as winning the whole thing. And that day taught me a lesson. Everybody assumed we were done. Everybody assumed it was finished. And had we at any point along the course of the race chosen to simply take a step back, no one would have said anything. Had we chosen to take a step back and just let the chips fall where they may, nobody would have cared. If we'd have gone out on leg six, Nobody in this room would have ever said, you know, I saw you on that Canadian Amazing Race show. What happened to you guys? You were doing so well. 
guys, we were never doing so well. No one would have ever blamed us, faulted us, or been surprised had we simply given up and checked out. Yet had we done that, we would have given up, we would have passed on, we would have neglected a championship that had one name on it. And whose name was that? The Tims. All we had to do was stay in our race and go get it. When that loser clap plays in your head, and I know that it does, I want you to stop and remember the Tims, who in the face of overwhelming odds, never seeing any hope of salvation, never seeing any hope of success, chose to follow the advice of a kindergarten teacher and get up every day and simply do their best, chose to have the courage to be content, chose to have the will to persevere. A lot of people said to me throughout the course of the race, Tim, you are so lucky. You have more horseshoes stowed about your person than any one man should be allowed to have. Yeah, there's another saying in there somewhere. And they're right. They're absolutely right. No one gets to go on the Amazing Race Canada and hit both non-elimination legs and go on and win the whole thing. It rarely happens. You can count it on about one hand how many times that has happened. They're right that we were inc incredibly lucky. But they also failed to overlook the fact that we were students of the game, that we knew this race. Before we ever left, my wife would set me down and tell me over and over and over again, Tim, pay attention. Pay attention. There's going to be something that you need to repeat, have memorized, have seen, something that you're going to need at the end of this race. Pay attention. And the fascinating thing is, is that on the very first leg of the race, the very first clue we were handed, at the top of that piece of paper was a flag. It was the flag of British Columbia. Folks, when I saw that flag, I all but heard an audible voice said, pay attention. That day when we came to the mat, there was a greeter standing there beside John the host, and you may have noticed the cowboy there in that one, one shot. He had a little pink flower on his lapel. Turned out to be the wild rose of Alberta. I saw that flower on the very first day in Kelowna. A little white flower turned out to be the dogwood flower of British Columbia. I all but heard a little voice. It said, pay attention. When we got to the very last task in the race, there were three giant maps of Canada set up. And when I say giant, I mean bigger than these screens. I needed a big step ladder to get to the top. We were handed two sets of placards. One was a set of pictures that had flowers on them. The other one was a set of pictures that had flags on them. There was only one old guy with Parkinson's who managed to complete the task of putting them on the appropriate territories and provinces we had visited in two tries and under about 10 minutes. Why? Because way back in leg three, they made a decision to persevere. And ladies and gentlemen, that perseverance led to this. It's rock and roll, baby. Father and son, Tim and Tim Jr. You got it, Dad. Here we go. Started the race with the added challenge of Tim Sr.'s Parkinson's. That diagnosis doesn't have to define your life. This guy's my hero right here. I'm really proud of him. Yeah! <laughs> leg after leg, Tim Sr. pushed himself beyond anyone's expectations. You can do more than you think you can. You just have to be willing to try. Good fortune smiled on the Tim. This is a non-elimination round? No. Not once, but twice. You are still in this race. <laughs> More than anyone, the Tims know it's now or never. Five years from now, I won't have the physical capability to do this race. We have to win. Won't have yeah. a second shot. Talk to 
talk to me. Seven provinces, oh. three territories, 15 cities, and over 23,000 kilometers. There we go! And you are the first winners of the amazing Race Canada. Tim Sr., Tim Jr., you guys have won two 2014 Corvette Sting Race, executive first class travel for a year from Air Canada to anywhere in the world, and a quarter of a million dollars. My dad has completely blown every expectation of him out of the water. Parkinson's isn't supposed to let you do half the things that he's done in this race. And he not only did them, he kicked their butt, man. Thank you. Yeah, somehow that just never gets old. <laughs> Hundreds of times later, and I still like watching it. My wife still cries. <laughs> well, folks, I understand the hard reality of this thing called Parkinson's. Without a cure, one day it may very well win the war that I wage with it. However, today's battle is mine. Parkinson's could not take the Amazing Race Canada away from me, and neither can it have my today. I will choose how I will live this day. I will choose to live my best. I will choose to have the strength to do the best that I can today. I will choose to stop and be content and grateful for all that I have been given that I can still do today. I will choose to persevere. My hope is for you that you will do the same, that you will take some encouragement some bit of hope, that you will find some joy and some peace in the midst of what can be a dark and lonely journey sometimes, and know that you have a community of people who love and support you and who will com commit to encouraging you ongoing. So when it gets hard, hear my voice. Hear your people. You can do this. You can live your best. And it can be an awesome life, even with Parkinson's disease. So God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to come share my story with you this morning. And all the very best to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is very kind. Thank you. Now, I think I am going to take some questions. Yes, we're going to start our question and answer session. And if you're online, if you have a question on Facebook, go ahead and submit it. Anybody have a question on this side? Yeah, how does that Corvette do in the snow in Winnipeg? Thank you, sir. You have kept alive the tradition of the Corvettes being the number one question every single time. <laughs> we'll persevere in that. Well, Corvettes are an interesting story. When we won the race, I had three children at home and an international student. I needed a new minivan. And as much as I desperately wanted those Corvettes, Neither my son or myself took them. It is the only se season, and I'm sure it's because we broke their hearts, that it was not in the contract that we had to take them. So we told them, we said, if you t make us take them, we're just going to sell them. Because what do I need a Corvette for in Winnipeg? I'm relatively young. My son was 23. It's going to cost him a fortune in insurance. Said, we need other cars. And so they wrote us a check for $55,000 each. And I took my kids to the south of France instead. 
and bought a minivan. <laughs> The, uh, the rest of the prize package there was um, 10 trips for two anywhere in the world that Air Canada flies. So that's uh, 20 uh, tickets. I split those with my boy. I figured that was the fair thing to do. Uh, my wife and I went to the South of France with three of the kids. We went to Croatia and um, Vietnam. Got some nice mileage out of those tickets. And my son, Tim Jr., he went to um, Chile to um, Australia and Japan. And then the $250,000 that I also felt was probably the right thing to do in splitting with them. I thought about that for a while. <laughs> well, being good Mennonites and a little heritage there and good Canadians, we put it all in the house on the mortgage. So that's where all the cash and prizes went. We have some questions. Yes, wait and let's talk into the microphone, please. I'm, I'm just curious as to what kind of medication are you taking for your Parkinson's? I'm on two different medications, and I'm always a bit hesitant to discuss medication without this preamble. First of all, I'm 53 years old. The one medication I am on, my doctor says he would rarely, if ever, prescribe to anyone much older than me much older, being probably past 65. Uh, that medication has done wonders for me, selegiline. Uh, I hear lots of things about selegiline, most that it doesn't work, or it gives you horrible side effects. And I hear lots of side effects come with, with age. Selegiline has one, done wonders for me. Um, I have gone from being, not being able to run, having incredible cramps, both in my feet and my arms, bizarre cramps with running to when I started my selegiline, it has allowed me to run again. And then I have, of course, on leva, levodopa, levocarb. But again, every single one of us are different. Just because it works for me does not mean a thing. So I say that with great hesitation and caution. Don't assume that what works for me will work for you. The nurse in me has to give that preamble. All right, and Pam is on the other side with a microphone. If you have a question, let's take out one from that side, and then we'll come back. Thanks for your words today, Tim. It's You're just been welcome. great. Uh, I can tell by what you've said that you love to travel. I love to travel, and several of us in the Voice Project love to travel. So maybe you would speak to uh, things that you should think about when you travel and to make travel safe for the Parkinson's person? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I, it, it's a question that has to be, it, it's a th thing that has to be kind of learned as you go, right? Because we went to um, Portugal, thank you. That's why I keep her around. <laughs> the, the, one, the wonderful side effect, the symptom for me is, this just doesn't work quite the way it used to. Portugal, beautiful place. We failed to note that it's extremely hilly, full of cobblestone. Cobblestone that's made out of limestone, which is, with the slightest bit of water, is extremely slippery. It was a great holiday. I'm not sure I'll go back to Portugal, though. <laughs> so planning ahead is one of the things I'm pointing to here. Um, even at 53, I, I have to be aware of of where I'm walking, of what I'm doing. Because yes, I can run, but in many ways, running is easier than walking some days. And especially the environment that I'm walking in. Planning ahead your medications. I had someone recently ask me, they say, you know, I see you go to Europe and you travel a fair bit and whatnot. How do you plan out your meds? Well, each medication is different. And so I've spoken to my physician about how do I stagger my medications out when I'm going to Europe and it's seven hours ahead. And so those are good conversations to have ahead of time, making sure that you take plenty of medications with you. I mean, in just about anywhere in Europe, you're going to be able to get Levocarb or most of the medications that we're on. But if you're like me, and you have a little bit of anxiety associated with this thing, the thought of running out of especially my selegiline now is just like, oh my gosh. 
I never leave home without my meds. I, have, I can't tell you how many times I have turned around to go back home to pick this up, even when I'm just going for somewhere for a little while. We're very attached now. So lots of pre-planning and understanding and being honest with where you're at. Very, very, very important. Not where your neighbor is, not where your buddies are, not where the rest of the gang with Parkinson's is at and what they can get away with, but what do you need for your trip to be successful? Because the last thing you want to do is get somewhere and think, well, Joe or Susie said they managed this okay, and you're finding that you don't. That's not the way you want to spend a holiday. You spend your hard-earned money on going somewhere fun. You want to enjoy it. So put in place all the things that you know that you'll need, and then I would encourage you to even take it a little step beyond that, just to have it covered, so that you get there and, you, and it's all good. You can have fun, your partner can relax with you, and everybody just knows things are in good shape. Make sense? Good, I bet you were walking with intent on those cobblestones. Well, let me tell you, I was walking with intent. I was scared to death half the time. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. This is for um, caregivers, too. This is wonderful. Um, tell us a little bit about your book. Oh, well, thank you. Don't get offers like that very often. <laughs> <laughs> the book came out of a desire to continue speaking, to be quite frank. I, I speak both for a lot of P Parkinson's events, but a lot, of, a lot of corporate events that have nothing to do with Parkinson's. So I got to asking other professional speakers, how do you stay in this gig? I, I'm enjoying it. I like traveling. I like speaking. How do you keep this moving? They said, you need two things. You need a website, and you need a book. So I thought, OK, I'll write a book. Got a little bit of an interesting birth story, a little bit of an interesting adoption story. The Amazing Race is certainly an interesting story. So I sat, sat down and started writing a book. Found out that I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Had about 30,000 words thrown on a page, or at least that's what Microsoft Word told me. And I wasn't getting anywhere. So I eventually hired a book coach that helped me get it put together, and then ended up going, falling into the lap of an agent, literally, uh, through a friend, another friend who was on the race. I was shocked that an agent would pick up my book uh, for any reason, because the, the goal was, of course, to self-publish. You know, spend a couple grand, have 12 copies of your book sitting in the corner, and be able to say that you're self-published, or that you're an author. The reality was is that that agent went on to get four offers for my manuscript. The last and best from Penguin Random House Canada, the largest book publisher in Canada. I was absolutely, my mind was blown. You've seen that little emoji on Facebook now, you know? Little <laughs> like, I never imagined that this would happen. But I have found that um, the idea of perseverance, the stories that I've been able to tell from my life, folks seem to take a lot of inspiration and a lot of encouragement from. And it has been a real blessing, both having the opportunity to explore some of my own past and reappreciate it and appreciate it in new ways, but also to see the, the encouragement and the joy that it gives others. So that's kind of how it came about. So if you do choose to buy it, I would be more than happy to sign it for you. I hope that you thoroughly enjoy it. And if you don't, don't leave an, don't say that on Amazon. We have time for another question. Okay, hold on. Give me a second to get over there. And while we're getting to that question, I'll just say that the book can be found on my website, timsenior.ca, on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, Audible, if you're not a reader and you would prefer to have it in audio form and listen to it, it's on audible.com. And don't tell them that I told you, but if you don't have an Audible account, your first book is often free. Hey, Tim. Uh, my name is Wanda, and I am from Winnipeg. So, and welcome to Dallas. Thank you. But Winnipeg is what, remains one of my favorite places. Oh my goodness! Do you know how often that happens? Like never. <laughs> <laughs> one question I have for you is about stress, because you mentioned, um, you know, that at, with Parkinson's you do experience stress like you never mm -hmm. did before, and 
when I watch The Amazing Race, I'm a big fan of it, I think I, think I could handle some of the physical challenges, but the mental duress yeah. that you go through on a race and I, is extraordinary. And I wanted to find out who kept you grounded with your stress? How did you manage to control your stress? Because I didn't see the shows, but I saw the clip, and you were doing pretty good physically. Yeah. But yeah. did the stress must have gotten to you. Well, you have to remember this is five years ago. Five, five years ago right now. This is our kind of our anniversary time. I didn't have the stress then that I do now. I've always been pretty type A personality, pretty OCD, like, like to have my ducks in a row kind of thing. But then it was much, it, it was very early on that some of the things were starting to set in for me. And it was later that I started to recognize um, some of this mild cognitive impairment that was starting to come along, that ability to plan and organize, that, uh, that ability to multitask. I now explain it to friends like, if you remember an old dial-up, internet, and you've got your first old PC going, and you have the internet open, you've got too many tabs open, and everything freezes, well, that's, that's this now. And stress will do that in a heartbeat. Everything just shuts down. So back then, that, it was fine. But people often ask me now, you know, well, how do you manage being the executive director of a charity? How do you manage writing a book? How do you manage speaking so much? Well, the reality with speaking, it's all I do. I don't book tickets. I don't make plans. I don't book hotels. I don't book cars. My wife does all of that. All of that stuff that's required to get me here, somebody else does. She does most of it. And if I had to do it, I promise you I wouldn't be here. I, I cannot deal with that stress. Uh, too much information, uh, it literally overwhelms me. Uh, everything literally sh shuts down, and I stop. Just stop. So, I am very, very, very fortunate to have an assistant, a wife, and a community who does lots of things for me. So, when you, th when you feel that you don't want to accept help, when you think you should be able to do your thing all by yourself, Good luck with that. <laughs> All right. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Let's give Tim Haig a round of applause. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.